بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Dear brothers and sisters, families, young people, children, youth, may the peace, mercy and blessings of Almighty God be with each and every one of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have to tell you at the outset that I am at a disadvantage because every time I see two huge sources of light just shining into my eyes and not being able to see the people I'm speaking with, I face that difficulty because I go blind. And it's because of a problem, inshallah, soon it will be resolved completely after 15 years. Make dua for me. But at the moment, I cannot see any of you. I'm just seeing that there are faces here and there. So I'll be talking basically to myself. <coughs> the title, as you heard, is Challenges Facing Muslim Families in Canada, in North America, in the West. And I'm glad that this morning, Dr. Jassim Limtawwa said in Arabic that we should not call the challenges problems. Because if we do, then we will concentrate on the negative side of challenges. Challenges are actually good. We cannot live our lives without challenges. Imagine, imagine if you look at an ECG of a live human being, an electrocardiogram, the electric image of what's going on in the heart. If we do not see the peaks up and down, and if we see a straight line going across, then we should be worried. Because a straight line without the ups and downs means that the person is dead. And the same thing goes for our lives. A monotonous life where everything is just perfect as we'd like to call it, is no life. Even Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu faced challenges. You know the story or stories, but one of them, the famous 29 days that he stayed outside of his house, where he had to deal with real family problems like we do, where you also remember Hadithat al-Ifq, the story where he had to struggle with himself and with the community around him when his honor was targeted by some people. People are people. And the Prophet ﷺ is a bashar, as the Quran mentioned. He is only different in that he received the wahi. Therefore, if you are facing challenges at home, don't feel guilty. Don't feel inadequate. Don't say that my family is no good. That I am not a good husband or a good father. Remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave each one of us a package that is unique. And He is looking at us to see how we will deal with that package. Remember that Nuh alayhi salam had one of his children disobey him even in faith. And he, that is Nuh, asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pleaded with him, said, Ya Allah, 
This is my son. Please save him like you saved the others. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that moment told him, no Nuh. Now he got to a point where there's no return. Nuh faced a problem. So did Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we saw how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his son Ismail fair with a command from Allah that anyone among us would not even like to see in a dream. Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam who used to receive wahi through dreams understood what it meant for him. But he was challenged. He was tested. Imagine going through such a challenge. We won't be able to handle it. Imagine the tests that Musa alayhi salam faced when he left his family trying to look for something that will bring them security in an open desert. Imagine Ayyub, the challenges he faced. And those prophets and messengers were only examples for us to understand. Now, facing challenges, whether it is in the West or in the East, wherever we are, challenges are challenges. Yet there is some uniqueness about Muslims living in the West. So that I do not continue theorizing. I would now bring myself into talking about specific challenges that we are facing. And I'm going to bring them to us under headings. So that we'll be able to follow. Number one and decisive and of utmost importance is the religious challenge because if we do not handle this challenge properly we will lose our identity our children will lose their identity and will be left with absolutely nothing to stand for as muslims as this is our identity i still remember Four and a half months ago, the mother on the other side of the phone begging me, please help me. My 21 years old son said to me, he has nothing to do with Islam anymore. He does not want to be a Muslim anymore. And he is at university, in third year university. Why is that? She said, because of those images he's been seeing on the internet and on television of people claiming to represent Islam and Muslims. And he's unable to reconcile those images with his identity as a Muslim. And she said, myself and his father were unable to try to convince him that this is not a representation of Islam. But he was not convinced. I met with that young man. A very intelligent young man. Who may represent the silent majority. Or maybe if you don't want me to exaggerate and I don't want to exaggerate. I don't want to say majority. But I will say this young man represents a segment of our youth, our children, wherein the parents are unable to deal with the religious challenge that the children have. And mind you, mind you, many a time parents face that challenge as well. It is not our children anymore. When we are seeing people who are claiming that they represent Islam, cutting the throats of people who refuse to enter into Islam, they are being killed, displayed on the internet to the entire world. We know that our Quran 
tells us the opposite. We know that the Quran simply says, لا إكراه في الدين. There is no compulsion in religion. قد تبين الرشد من الغي وقل الحق من ربكم فمن شاء فليؤمن ومن شاء فليكفر. This is what our Quran says. So where did they bring a new version of Islam? Where did this come from? But this is a global challenge. This is a global challenge that I do not want to simplify or belittle. There are reasons why certain individuals who are born into Islam or who entered Islam because of certain reasons are becoming radicalized. Just go on the internet and find how many sites are asking what's the cause of radicalization? What's the cause of having our children just verge into radicalism? The, where did they bring this radical Islam? Fanatic Islam? Isn't Islam just Islam? Nowadays, unfortunately, I tell you that part of this phenomenon or what may explain it is that ask any Muslim, what do you think of Salafi Islam? What about Sufi Islam? What about Ikhwani Islam? What about Jama'a Islamiyya Islam? What about Tahriri Islam? What about Takfiri Islam? What about Sunni Islam? What about Shi'i Islam? What about... Now, now, it's becoming the norm to just have a hyphenated Islam. It is not enough anymore to just say, I am a Muslim. Quite often now, when I'm invited into a community that I've never visited before, there's always the question, who is he? What kind of Muslim is he? And when I answer, I'm just a Muslim, they say, yeah, we know, but... Uh, and they really get into that mode of trying to insist that I have to belong to something. And I refuse. I tell you, my children asked me, are we Hanafi or Shafi'i? And I told them I will not make the mistake of my father. When he told me what school of fiqh that he followed and made me follow. When my children asked me, I said, no, we are Muslim. But what kind of, oh, we are Muslim and that's enough. So the challenge, the religious challenge is from within. And there is a segment which is from outside our community. From within our community. And this is something that we have to deal with in the West. Our children now, technologically, are more open than we could have dreamt of when we were in their age. I was telling Brother Zaid that, you know, when I used to travel, I used to write my father a letter to tell him what I've been doing. He would receive the letter 10 days after, and the news would be 10 days old. Now our children... We were driving from Edmonton to Vancouver. And on the way, I needed some help with maps. And Baba, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And in less than 30 seconds, the answer will be with me. So I cannot tell my children, now, don't look at the world. I just want you to do this. And I can't. Because now the world is open. What I can do is vaccinate them. Because now, if you consider the world an epidemic, and there's no reason to look at the world with negative spectacles. The world can be beautiful, even though right now, the world is awful. But our children right here have the potential to revisit everything. And that's why we have this, that, many in the Muslim world cannot dream to hold before, before every lecture, 
written script, the organizers, everyone that is even supplying food to the people attending will be examined by secret service or al-mukhabarat. It cannot take place without that happening. We are fortunate. Therefore, when we are talking, it's not only to lecture. We are talking because we want to translate this into practical steps wherein our children will come together and then through the internet will go back to the world and say we need to have some tajdeed, some new look at our Islam that was taken away from us. We need to reclaim the Islam of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to give it back to our children because our children were now fed with so many different versions of Islam except that one from the source from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The religious challenge is so real. Let me not forget with all due respect all due respect to our imams. There are still communities that insist to bring an imam from the country where the majority of them in Canada came from. They want an imam that speaks Gujarati or speaks Arabic with an Egyptian accent or speaks Lebanese, or speaks this, or have the understanding, our children are no more from the country where I came from. You know, I'm asked this question quite often. What nationality do you have? Honestly, after 38 years in Canada, I hesitate to answer this question. I feel 100% Canadian. I am Canadian. But before that, I am a global Muslim. I belong to the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but with a Canadian outlook. Where is Imam Ziyad? Where is he? I applaud you on a book that I would like every Canadian Muslim to read. He is not inventing a new Islam when he said Canadian Islam. But he is alluding to the need that we have to go outside to the world around us. Not as we and you, but as part of the Canadian society and network. We need, and this is now the first practical suggestion, all of this that I said was talking about the problem. Let's now write down number one. Number one, it is urgent. It is a must that we take our youth who have the tendency to lead and we develop their leadership skills and we educate them in Islam to be the Imams of the Muslims in Canada. It is enough now. Our generation, with all due respect, I use it just to communicate, not to show disrespect, God forbid. Enough importing Imams from overseas. We need to teach our children skills of leadership so that they will be our imams. They speak English without the accent that I have. They understand the society much more than I do. I had to learn by trial and error. They grew up in this society. They understand what it's like and they need to be encouraged to do outreach instead. And please forgive me, I know now I will lose three quarters of you they would say, we don't want to listen anymore. Because I said it before, and God is my witness. He knows what I mean. I am an advocate to have our children vaccinated with Islam 
and be given to the public school system so that they can mingle so that they can grow with their Islam among others. We should not isolate our children behind Islamic school walls. But I say that with qualification that if you cannot teach your children proper Islam, the Islam, the, the Islam of the middle path, then we need to go to our community, to our masajid, to our centers, and to try to find ways where we can and it's different from one province to another. We have to teach our children enough and then let go so that they can mix and keep their Islam. Not after grade eight or after high school, when they go to university, they will have a culture shock. And then the dichotomy of personalities will start. They will start to live two lives and I've seen Many children who went to Islamic schools and now their parents wish that they never send them to Islamic schools. This is a disaster. When the parents say, I wish I never put my children in Islamic schools. This is a disaster. And I say to communities, it is not a status thing in any community that we want to build a school. Now, do you have the financial resources to pay your teachers? Well, you know, they don't need to be paid like other teachers. We will just give them 22,000 a year and they will be fine. No, it is not fine, brothers and sisters. Our teachers are human beings too. And if they have to live below poverty line, they will not teach. It is not enough to have taqwa to be a good teacher. Many teachers at Islamic schools are chosen because... Please forgive me. I'm talking to my family. Am I allowed to speak freely? Would you allow me to speak freely? It is not enough to choose a teacher because of the length of his beard. That is not what we are looking for or because of her hijab. A teacher has skills. We need to make our children love what they are learning. So now, instead of building mediocre Islamic schools. Let us now, when I start talking, I don't know if I'll have time, but you see, this is, this is a whole conference kind of topic. You know, as Imam Ziyad mentioned, I've done, I can't count how many fundraisers, but every time I do it, I feel guilty. You know why? Because we raise funds, we put them in brick and mortar, and then we go back and say we need more. And we put them, and now we need more. What we need, please, consider this, I'm skipping into the financial challenge to our families and youth. You know what that means? The financial challenge, I submit to you, please, if a few among you will get together and will declare a moratorium on fundraisers to build masajid and Islamic schools, we have enough. Let us raise funds to establish endowment funds, awqaf, and then invest that. And from that, you will see after a few years that the financial challenge, economic challenge will be lessened and we will be able to do what we want to do. Now we are trying to reach our beautiful target on a limp. We are unable to reach successfully because we are limping. We are limping back to the religious challenge. So I established two practical things now. One religious, having our children learn how to be our imams. And one is a financial economic challenge and that is to establish endowment funds. Now, now number three, religious challenge. We need to be open with our children. We need to have workshops for us to show them that the images they are seeing are mutations, are disasters that are challenging all people, all people, and that we need to understand what is happening without 
Ah, oh. and this is a plea. This is a plea because I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen among Egyptian families, among Syrian families, mostly. And I tell you why. I've seen brothers and sisters, husband and wife, develop tension among each other because this brother is with Mursi, this brother is with Sisi. And you know what? This is, this is, yes, I, 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 I mention things by name. This person is with Al-Nidham, this is with Al-Mu'arada in Syria. They used to love one another. Our communities are breaking at the scene and this is a global challenge. Now, number three practical suggestion. I plead with you. Leave, leave the politics to a think tank that will bypass. Listen to me, read my lips. We need now as those people are fighting it out, let us bypass this dark tunnel into something open so that when they exhaust each other's efforts, we will be ready with our thoughts to build a future that cannot wait until things get better because we already are seeing how how, you know, even our, our culture is being stolen away from us. When I heard that the Umayyad Masjid in Halab was destroyed, when I heard that certain Islamic cultural landmarks were totally abolished and taken away, when I heard that in many places in the Muslim world, things are not the same anymore. And when I talk about things, I don't mean stones and rocks and things. I talk about humans as part of things. You know, imagine, imagine the generation that was born and raised in conflict. What will that generation teach? What will that generation do? We need our youth and children to be protected from that and bypass with our help. So I hope that leaders, you know, that I met in my uh, uh, visit this time, would bring the young people, will think, will talk, will, will on a weekly basis. Don't just leave it to the internet to educate and to YouTube to scare and terrify. We can't afford to allow that to happen. Because of time, I will now pass from the religious challenge. If I remember something that I skipped, I will come back to it. Now I would like to talk about social challenges of Muslim families and youth. Social families, the fact is, and please forgive me, parents, parents forgive me. You may say, oops, oops. He's talking about, let us talk about our mistakes. Let us uncover our mistakes. The problem, the cha I said problem, I shouldn't, I take it back. The challenge, social challenge, is that parents who came from overseas and established themselves in Canada expect their children to be mirror images of themselves when they were back where they were. This cannot happen, nor should it happen, because this is misguided. This is not right. I Plead with fathers and with mothers. Allow your children to grow freely in their space under your supervision. Under your supervision. And you know what? I mentioned this morning in my introduction 
that, you know, my father was worried. He did not want to migrate to Canada. But alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy looked after his worry and things worked. Maybe by trial, by error. And I still, I tell you, I tell my children, I still end up, even though I speak about parenting and about family challenges, I end up like when Dr. Walid was asked, how successful are you with your children? I say the same thing as Dr. Walid. I end up making the same mistakes that my father made with me. I, I, I can't because part of me is capturing from my father naturally what I think represented his fatherhood to me. But it takes effort on my part, on my part to modify as per a saying that is attributed either to Imam Ali bin Abi Talib or to Umar ibn al-Khattab. They don't know who said it, but it doesn't matter. One of them said, Teach your children in a style different than your style because they are born into a generation different than yours. I cannot expect my son to do the things I did when I was his age. But at the same time, I have to instill in him the immutables, the things that never change. I cannot tell my son, well, now you are living in Canada, so you can pray three times a day. I cannot tell my son that if all around you may do certain things that you can just conform with them. As we read in Surah Yusuf, that the majority of people are not going to be like us, people of faith. Even if we go and make da'wah day and night, they are not going to be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that he created humans on this planet and humans are given free choice. And you know what? Many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, read Surah Al-An'am, read Surah Al-Kahf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, why would you lose your sleep and why would you get so upset if people would not respond to your message? All you have to do is to tell them what the message is and leave it to them. And leave it to them. Therefore, I tell you, and this is where I fail. And I fail miserably. And my son is listening to me right now. And my daughter, so that they don't say that you only talk about, you know, our brother. Okay. The, where I, I fail is that because I go and I speak about da'wah to, to, to members of the global Muslim community, Something inside me is saying that they've got to be Mr. and Miss Perfect. That's what I expect. But you know what? The reality is that this is impossible. They are children like other children. And they would like, as my son tell me, but don't say it again. Okay, now he's smiling, he's laughing. Okay, now he says, I'm only a child. I'm only a child. And he keeps repeating this. And you know what? You know what? He is. He's only 13 years old. And we've got to understand that what we have to do as per what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us is to take our parenting as a full-time task. Not just whenever we can or whenever we are feeling comfortable. Or No, 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 no. It's a full-time job. Do your parenting job and say, Ya Allah, hasbi Allah, wa ni'mal wakil. That's it. Tawakkaltu ala Allah. I depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is all we can do. And don't feel guilty if things do not turn out the way you want them to be. I always dreamt that my children will be A plus students. Well, if they do not have that ability, do not go and put them down as, you know, my father never put me down, but I tell my children something that my father, you know, always used to repeat in front of me. 
You know, I was always the top of the class from kindergarten to university, alhamdulillah. But every time I come to him and say, you know, Baba, I got 98. He'll say, what happened to the two marks? He used to say that. What happened to the two marks? This is his way of parenting. Now, they tell you the new methods now. If your son or daughter comes with a 70, don't start, you know, no. This is not right. So a social challenge of families is that we need to learn how to be parents of our children in an environment that is totally different than the environment we grew up in. Another social challenge, and this is a problem, is our children are reaching marriage age. And we are finding difficulty getting them together for marriage. Back home, my grandmother and our neighbor and my aunt and my this and my that would take care of all of this because in no time they discover there is a girl suitable for marriage. You don't worry about it. You will have 20 people in line. But here it's different. And we need to do something to help families deal with that because if parenting fails, the parents are not experienced parents and the girls and boys are growing away from their parents. And now they are doing things behind their parents' backs. And this is a big problem. If you do not befriend your children, you really need to understand that you need to be their friend as Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know the seven and seven and seven. You know the 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 first seven years and the second seven years and the third seven years, and then after that, let go, let go. And this is this is a, a course in parenting given by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now I know many 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 families whose daughters came to them, not even sometimes come to them. I know one father who came to me crying. He was a fixture at the masjid, all five salawat, all of that. And then he came crying. And by the way, it's the saddest story. The saddest story, that same father, because of what happened to his daughter and his son. And, 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 and. are you prepared to, do, to, to hear this? He abandoned Islam. He abandoned Islam. Because sometimes shaitan comes, comes to people in, 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 in very powerful ways. And, and we have to be very careful. This father came and he said, can you read this card for me, please? And I read it. It was a wedding invitation sent from his daughter to him and his wife, inviting them to her wedding. He said, I knew absolutely nothing about this. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Now what happened? What happened? He set his priority to come to the masjid five times every day and please listen to me. You know, again, if I get myself in trouble, Allah is my witness. Allah is my witness. You see, back where I lived, my father used to take us every salat to the masjid because the masjid was maybe 20 meters from our apartment. And then we will pray and come back. No problem. And now I know many people who are, who are denying some people who work long hours and they want to spend time with their families, pray jama'ah with their families, and then go every now and then for jama'ah at the masjid. They say, you are not a good Muslim. You've got to come every time. And now what happens? What happens? The father is spending time away because now after he comes from Isha, he has to sleep, go for Fajr and then go to work and then come and the same thing and his family does not see him. Now we need in Canada to have the fiqh understood whereby we allow families to grow. Yes, they go together to the masjid. Whenever it's a long weekend, let's all go together. It's the weekend, let's have qiyam together. Let's and have these things done together as a family. Because back where I came from and where you came from and where you came from, sisters, it's different. 
So how can we import something and say, we've got to do it the same way here? You know, Imam Shafi'i moved from Iraq to Egypt. When he was in Iraq, he was asked about certain fatwa. He gave his fatwa. He moved to Egypt. He was asked the same questions. He gave different fatwa. They said, yeah, Imam, you forgot? You told us this. You know what he said? He said, that was Iraq. This is Egypt. Allahu Akbar. If, if, if our imams would know that this is our Islam, this is our Islam. You know, every year I go for hajj. People come to me and they say, we went to this imam and we told them that we did Rami al-Jimar before Zawal. And he told us that we have to slaughter an animal and that our Rami is unacceptable and this and that. And, and you know that imam ought to have known that there is leniency. Why don't we preach that and let Muslims enjoy? But imams think that, I'm not generalizing, please, because some of you started to frown in my face. Can I see you smiling, please? Because this is not a funeral, by the way. Can you smile? Everybody is smiling? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Alha no, some of you are not smiling yet. That's better. That's better. We really need to open up and be lenient to understand that Islam is so beautiful. So back to the social challenges. Social challenges. We need to really have different ways of making our children meet under our supervision. Are you prepared to hear this? Who is in charge of a masjid here? Who is in charge of a masjid? Okay, brother. You know, there are masajid where women are strictly placed behind black barriers. And when they go to the malls and things, they see men like we see women, like, you know, but at the masjid, they don't know anybody. And we don't know anybody. Now, I ask the question, was this the case at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No comment. No comment. Why are we making it difficult for our children to meet in halal under our super, especially that we need to overcome the social challenge, the social challenge. And guess what? We continue to live by our opinion, even though Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us otherwise, even though we read in the Quran otherwise. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about those parents. When they are approached, let's say a father who is Lebanese, a mother who is Lebanese, they are approached by someone who is Pakistani. They want to marry the daughter. Okay, absolutely. Don't even talk about it. Why? Why? No, 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 no. This does not suit us because now we continue to be ethnic in our decision making when it comes to marriage. And I know that in Lebanon even, it's not enough to be Lebanese. You've got to be from the same village. And it's not enough to be from the same village. You've got to be from the same extraction in that village. Is that what Islam came to teach us? So these are social challenges. Social challenges. Remember that in Quebec, in Quebec, they were talking about banning hijab in public places. And had that passed, it would have been a disaster. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Quebecois government, Party Quebecois, lose because of that proposal. Alhamdulillah. However, however, I would like to share with you that our Islam came for all places, all times, and there is shari allowance. Yes, I know, I know that there are differences in the way people interpret the niqab versus the hijab versus, you know, we've got to be receptive to all. Do not deny anyone the right to be comfortable in Islam because this is a social challenge. I know I made this mistake 18 years ago and I will never repeat it. 18 years ago, I went 
at the pulpit of the Islamic Center in London, Ontario. And I said, I will not give a single lecture unless every woman who is in this place having the hijab. You know what happened? They stopped coming. They stopped coming. And I discovered that I do not want to preach to the converted. I want to reach the hearts of those who need to hear my message. Therefore, therefore, I would welcome with modesty, with respect, everyone who comes to the masjid at the Islamic Center. And they come and guess what? Many, many among them put the hijab, convinced, convinced. And this is where I want to have an appendix and say, please do not force the hijab on your daughters. Please. I've seen the rebounding energy that it can get quite negative and it can go all the way. Even salat, salah, which is the main... Am I in trouble here? Okay. When you see the person introduced you behind you, you know that the time is up. So how many hours do I still have? Is the red flag... Uh, is it the red flag? I didn't even see the, uh, the green one. Or the white, because I wasn't looking that way. I will, I will finish, you know, with this. You know, what was I talking about? Salat. Salat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for salat, which is, which is Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, what does he say? If you can read my mind. If you can read my mind, somebody. وَأَمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Yes, tell them to pray. They have to pray, but be patient. Be patient. Which is more important, salat or hijab? Therefore, I know many fathers who commanded and forced their daughters to put on hijab. You know why? Because they did not want their friends to talk about them. So it was the me. I wanted, I wanted to appear in front of my friends as someone who took care of my family. And it's not because I really wanted my daughters to wear the hijab. So let us, you know, I apologize. I made the same mistake. I fell in the same trap. Because I've spoken about this topic many a time. And every time I say, no, 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 this time I'm going to stick to the time limit and I'll mention all the challenges. But today I made the same thing. I only mentioned religious and I mentioned financial, economic and I mentioned social challenge. And you know, there's still political, there is legal, there is educational, there is security challenge. There is a time that we have to be very careful may come upon us. Very careful if we do not really do the right thing and reach out to the people around us so that they will feel comfortable, so that they will love us. If we don't do that, we will be in, I shouldn't say we, our children will be in big trouble. We will be long or not long gone because this may happen in our lifetime even. You know, the danger is real. People do not like us and I will end. I needed to mention this, but I would have liked to end on a positive note, but I will mention it as a doctor talking to his patients and I'll say, please, let's do something about it. 52% of Canadian, according to Angus Reid, do not like Islam or Muslims. Did you hear what I said? The number? 52% do 
do not like us and do not like our deen in Quebec the number was 81 percent in Alberta it was 76 percent the 52 percent is the national average what really brought the number down was the average in Ontario because because of the very high ethnic presence. Half of the Muslims in Canada live in Toronto. And that's why, that's why the numbers were brought down. Otherwise, people are telling us that we don't like you. And you know, we can do what we used to do in the 70s. I know in the 70s, we used to talk about the conspiracy theory. The world is conspiring against us. Forget it. It's us. We've got to reach out to the world and do what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. He, by action, made his neighbors love him and love Islam and Muslims. Jazakumullah khair wa salamu alaykum.